Hello and welcome everyone to another open air training webinar on the Horizon Europe open science requirements in, uh, in practice. So uh, before we start, I will quickly go over some housekeeping notes. Uh, so this webinar uh, will be recorded and we will make the recording publicly available shortly afterwards. If you have any questions or you would like to share any thoughts or comments, you can use the Q&A section in this, uh, in this meeting. You can also use the same section to upvote any questions you would like our speakers to address first. And in case we fail to uh, address all of them, we will make sure to follow up in a blog post after this, uh, this webinar. Uh, you can also find the link to the presentations uh, here in this slide and you can use the QR code to be directed to them so you can access them. And I will make sure to also quickly pop the link to the chat as well. Uh, so with this, I would like to briefly introduce and give a warm welcome to our speakers for today. So first of all, we have Jonathan England, the training specialist uh, of Open Air, who will be going over the uh, Open Science Horizon Europe requirements and, uh, and also share some, uh, some tips, some tools and some services that you can use to make sure that you're compliant with them. And we also have Victoria Chukala, Open Science Policy Officer at the European Commission, who will be talking to us about uh, the EC's Open Access uh, Publishing Platform, Open Research Europe. Uh, so with this very brief introduction, I would like to give the floor now to Jonathan so they can start with their presentation. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, thanks, Athena, for the presentation. So, um, today we're going to, over the uh, next hour, we're going to go over some of the requirements, but also some of the open science aspects that you need to include in the grant proposal. And then we will have half an hour for um, some Q&A. So uh, the slides are already online on the Nodo, and on the first slides, you just have all the links to, uh, to the different materials that I will be mentioning during the talk. Uh, they, we just created also some quick guides uh, on on our on our platform called Open Plato. So you're welcome to um, to have a look at those. So first, I want to mention what uh, is open science in terms of the European Commission, and um, I want to emphasize that obviously you know about open access to publication and uh, about data management. But the uh, European Commission is really um, strong on uh, following the FAIR principles, which I will mention later in, in, the, uh, in the talk. Uh, the principles of uh, opening the data as openly as possible, as closed as necessary. I'll go back again uh, about this. And there's a, an emphasis also on the information about output tools, instruments that are needed to validate and reuse the results and the data, as well as um, giving access if needed for the digital or physical um, results to validate the conclusions. Um, so in terms of open access to publications, uh, we have a few rules which are different. If you knew the um, the uh, uh, Horizon 2020 are a bit different. So this time around, we need to have um, the uh, one of the versions of the manuscript deposited on the trusted repository. I'll go back in a second of what the definition of a trusted repository is. Um, the biggest difference is that there's no embargo period allowed. Now you have to have to provide immediate open access to the publication. And also as authors, you need to retain your rights at least on the author accepted manuscript and if possible also on the version of record. Um, and you need to apply what is a Creative Commons license. Again, those are terms that I will define in, in a second, um, but this is just an overview. Um, obviously, uh, don't forget to add the acronym, the code of the project within, and I uh, will repeat this um, again, but uh, the European Commission does want uh, you to add as much information as possible about research outputs or tools, instruments, anything that needs to be um, present to validate the conclusions of the publication. There are a few um, exceptions in the sense that um, you can 
um, have the uh, open access fees, so the article processing charges um, um, covered through the, the grant only if it's in a full open access journal. If it is um, in a hybrid journal where it's a um, traditional uh, uh, subscription model, but that allows for authors to choose the uh, the um, the APC routes, those are not reimbursable. So there's no restrictions in where you can publish, but just restrictions about um, how much you can um, um, claim back in terms of the money. If you are more in the humanities and write uh, long text formats or monographs or books, then the license can be a bit different. Okay, that's a weird. Uh, I don't know what's happening with the slides, but okay. Um, so a few definitions about uh, the um, what I mentioned before: the author accepted manuscript and the version of records. Um, you might have heard about uh, before what was referred to as postprint and the um, publisher's version. Basically, when you upload your, um, when you submit your your article or your piece of uh, work to the publisher, it is before peer review called the preprint. Then it undergoes all the peer reviewing process and becomes after all this, uh, the, the final accepted version is what's called the author accepted manuscript. It is basically the same version as once the editor has done all the, the publisher has done all the copy editing and the typesetting, it becomes a version of record. So the author accepted manuscript and the version of record are the same content. Uh, it's just different layouts. It's what I call the author accepting manuscript is what I call the ugly version of the, if your paper, it's basically not, um, not copy edited. So one thing that I want to emphasize to to uh, to emphasize also is uh, this self archiving route. You don't always have to pay for open access, especially considering that the European Commission doesn't reimburse if it's in a hybrid journal. You should always try and, if possible, go the the, the free route, which is by uh, self archiving. But you still need to follow the the guidelines that are set by the the Commission. So it's really where you make it uh, available, not where you publish it. And so for this, there's I, I won't go into too much details, but you can ask uh, questions during the Q&A if you want. Um, but you have this journal checker tool that allows you to, to check uh, basically whether you're the, um, the journal you're uh, submitting to allows for this rights retention strategy which is basically a statement saying that the author accepted manuscript, so this ugly version that I mentioned before, um, you can apply a Creative Commons license onto it and therefore retain your rights. And by by default, you can upload it on a repository as uh, uh, wherever you want. There is another route that is also um, available to you. And this is what Victoria will mentioned uh, later, but the European Commission has its own publishing platform, which is called Open Research Europe. And they self-archive, uh, they archive, sorry, on, on, on a trusted repository immediately. So meaning you don't have to do this uh, self-archiving, you just need to publish directly on it. But um, uh, Victoria will go uh, more in details about this. In terms of requirements for research data, uh, it is also quite different from the um, Horizon 2020. Uh, you must follow what's uh, they call the FAIR principle, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. You need to create a data management plan, a DMP, by month six, and you need to update it um, at least mid-project and before the end of the project. And biggest difference, you must deposit at least the metadata. So the metadata is all those uh, fields that are uh, attached to to a data set or a file that explain what it is. So what the authors is are of the 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 the, the data, uh, if uh, what license is uh, on it, what language, what journal, all this kind of information is what was called metadata. 
So you need to deposit at least the metadata, but if possible, the data itself as soon as possible after it's been produced or generated or gathered. Um, and you must deposit again in a trusted repository and make them as open as possible, following this um, this motto of as open as possible, as close as necessary. Um, just so you know, when you deposit metadata or data on a trusted repository, they automatically uh, deposit under uh, the CC0 license, which is what the European Commission uh, requires. So it's, it is a requirement that you, if you look at the annotated uh, grant agreement, you will see that this is one of the requirements, but just so you know, you don't need to really um, take this into account because if you publish in the deposit on the trusted repository, it will uh, automatically do it for you. Uh, there's a preference for the CC BY license or CC0 license, um, and the difference being that the CC BY, you always have to cite the the, the origin of the, the data itself. CC0 is basically you're putting it in the public domain. And there are reasons which I'm not going to go through today, but there are some reasons why uh, CC0 is um, preferable in terms of uh, sharing data. And again, when I, I said before <clears throat> about uh, detailed information about the research outputs in tools, instruments are, are needed to validate, uh, validate the data. And there are some justifications that uh, for not opening the data and the European Commission does insist a lot on this, that if there's a potential commercial uh, exploitation of the result, then you should definitely not share them uh, immediately. Um, you should definitely uh, try and exploit those uh, those results um, if possible. So those are one of the reasons uh, data protection, data privacy, rules of sensitive and uh, personal data obviously are also um, uh, reasons why not to share the data. Although you can anonymize the data and therefore make it available uh, anonymized, that's another way of, so you might not share all the data, but you share parts of the data that is anonymized. And if there's any security rules uh, for um, projects dealing with um, assets from the EU that uh, would put um, a security risk basically. So I've mentioned quite a few uh, keywords that I haven't really defined yet. So one of them is trusted repositories. You will see on the annotated grant agreement, there are specific rules for the trusted repositories. Basically, you, what you need to remember is to try and, and find um, in your discipline, in your, um, in your uh, research domain, a, a repository that is commonly used and endorsed by your research community. And you can do this for publication. You can look on Open Door, which is um, the open um, directory of open access repositories. And if you're looking for trusted repositories for data, it's Risri Data where you can find uh, this type of uh, repositories. If for any reasons there you don't um, there's no um, domain specific repository in for your uh, field of uh, work, then you can upload it onto a, a general uh, purpose repository such as Zenodo, which is you can uh, put data, uh, presentations, uh, publications, anything you, you want on, on that. Um, the other, um, as I said, the the other um, criteria for a trusted repository we can kind of uh, put aside um, because if it's listed on those um, on those lists then it it would be considered as a trusted repository for the European Commission. I've also mentioned quite a few times this Creative Commons license. So Creative Commons is basically a, a type of um, licensing that tells others what they can and cannot do with your data. So for instance, with a Creative Commons uh, attribution license, it, it means that they can reuse even for commercial purposes, as long as they, um, they cite the, the, 
the the authors of the original data or the original uh, publication. Um, it is um, still a, a legal uh, license in the sense that if someone does not cite you, you can still take legal actions against them if uh, if you want to, if if you need to be. The Creative Commons Zero license is a bit different where you best practice is obviously to cite the authors, but uh, it's not required anymore. And this is more for data um, for different reasons. Data management plan is something also I mentioned for the that is required by month six. It is a formal living document um, that basically tell or the European Commission that basically that you know what you're doing with uh, within your project. So it's going to say um, what the um, how you're going to share the data within the different uh, during the project within the different uh, partners. It's going to say how you're going to ensure the, if you're dealing with personal data, how you ensure the security of the data. It's going to say what you're going to do after the end of the project, how you're going to share it openly, uh, if you need to put any restrictions. Um, and it's living because you will, if there are any changes or if you went for one repository and then you realize that um, this repository is not the best, I'm going to go for a different one, then you would update the, the DMP and to, to reflect those, uh, those changes. The issue we, we have with DMPs, well, we more you when you're writing a DMP is that there's no absolute right or wrong answers. You just have to be clear uh, and detailed, justify basically all the decisions that you take. So as a, as a small uh, example, you might be using a, um, a for-profit um, uh, platform to share during the project, like um, 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 I forgot the name now, but one of those um, Microsoft Office, for instance, you might share it with uh, this for-profit um, that is not the, the best in terms of, um, um, of openness, um, but uh, you might justify it saying, well, everyone is using Teams, for instance, so we are going to use this platform to make our life easier but then we will use uh, a different mean of sharing it, such as Zenodo. So as long as you detail why you're making those decisions, then the project officer should um, should be fine with uh, with this. Or they will challenge basically what you've uh, you've decided on or make you aware of other, um, other tools that could be better than you hadn't thought about. Um, and you need in this DMP basically to show that you're sharing your data as openly as possible, as close as necessary, following those fair principles. I know, talking about fair principles, um, there's this question of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. So findable is basically when you have attached a person to persistent and identify a unique uh, URL, basically. That's usually the uh, the publishers for publications, they give you uh, what's called a, a DOI. So that's a person persistent identifier. As long as you um, um, put a lot of data, um, put a lot of information, so uh, informing what the data is, so rich, metadata that's also allowing for others to find your your work accessibility is making sure that you deposit on a trusted repository because it doesn't necessarily need accessible doesn't need to be open so accessible accessibility means that it is on a automated way of accessing the 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 data but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is open there's a big difference between the the frame principles and the openness, they are two different um, um, concepts. Interoperability is basically where you're going to use uh, file formats that are um, better for others to be able to reuse. The biggest, the, the, um, the easiest example is uh, sharing your data, your tables uh, on the CSV file format rather than the Excel file format.
<clears throat> and reusability is basically having this kind of readme files and having a clear license um, so that people know what they can and cannot do with uh, with your work. You always need to have this data availability statements. Um, so all the articles need to, to have that. Um, and even when there is no data associated with the, the article. Um, <clears throat> it should be added to the end of the article prior to the submission. And um, it should be fair in the, the, um, in the principles of accessibility, as I was saying. Uh, saying a statement, uh, you can send an email to the corresponding author to have access to the data. This is not accessible in terms of the FAIR principles. It needs to be on the trusted repository so that people can have access to it. But again, it doesn't have necessarily to be open. It can be under embargo for, let's say, two years, for instance, or it can be closed completely for uh, security reasons or for personal data um, reasons. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a few specific cases that I want to mention. Um, the validations of findings, uh, you always need to, even if the data is restricted or closed uh, for security reasons or other types of reasons that you justified in the, in the DMP, um, <clears throat> you still need to sometimes grant access to specific people for um, validations of the findings. Um, it's all about transparency, but it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, open. And in case of public emergencies, that's um, got more um, concrete with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, those restrictions are set, can be uh, can be changed by the Euro European Commission and require you basically to um, publish your work and your data immediately without without embargo. A few useful uh, tools um, before we talk about um, the uh, Open Research Europe. <clears throat> uh, Open Air Explore is a platform that, um, so I've put a lot of text here, but it's for reference uh, if you want to have a read afterwards. Open Air Explore is basically a platform that links uh, uh, data sets, uh, publications, um, people together. And so it creates this, um, this um, connections. And so you can search for a data set, you can search for a paper and then see that there are specific people involved or specific data sets are attached to your publications. You can also use it to find a trusted repository in, in your field. Um, so it has a, a lot of um, potential in, in terms of uh, finding the right tools that are, are for you. Um, Amnesia is an anonymization tool that you can use to anonymize the data, which is good so that you can share at least one version of the data not the uh, um, not the so so you don't disclose any personal data and <clears throat> argos is one of the uh, tools that you can use to help your the process of writing a data management plan um so there are many different tools for that and we're just only citing one today but you can obviously use uh, whichever you you want the good thing is that it has some, um, it is already um, indexed, for instance, in OpenAI Explore, which is um, what the European Commission uses to uh, to check that, for instance, your, you did um, publish your, you did make your uh, work, um, your publication available in open access and you did share the data. So it can have a lot of, um, um, it can be really useful in in that in that regard, um, and there are some community calls that you can join every every month. Um, so, in terms of the um, so 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 now up to now was the requirements, and now I'm going to mention what's the uh, the reporting and the monitoring that you have to do in the participants uh, portal. Um, so in the, the partisan portal, there's uh, different aspects that you need to, to look at that they, 
project officer will look at in terms of open science only. I'm not uh, I'm not talking about the other KPIs. I'm only talking about um, the open science elements of open access to publications and of uh, data. So there's the tab publications that uh, automatically you can add uh, just by uh, citing the DOI and it will automatically import all the metadata so you don't need to fill in uh, it yourself. So that's really useful. And that is this, um, all this in information comes also, it's the same kind of data that comes from uh, when you do a search on OpenAI Explore. Um, so here's just for reference what uh, all of them um, for for future reference is when you're actually doing the the reporting. In terms of data set, there's also another um, uh, another tab for for that. And again, if you fill in the um, the the DOI or any other type of identifier that the um, trusted repository that you deposited in um, has, then it will automatically import all the metadata for, for you. So you don't have to fill in, you know, fill in the author, when was it published and all that, all that will automatically be done for, for you. There's also two other tabs which are important for the open science um, monitoring is the results and the other results uh, tab. Uh, so the results, it, it's, it's a, I find it slightly confusing um, because the distinction is um, can be a bit confusing when you're not uh, doing this uh, every day. The results tab focus on the content of the results, so any discoveries, series, products, services, methods, so how you're basically doing the, the research. And the other result is for reporting about other type of that are not publications that are not data sets. So software, workflows, protocols, prototypes, or this type of um, data that is um, not publications and not data sets. And on this now, I'd like to invite uh, Victoria to um, share about the, um, Open Research uh, Europe. Thank you, Jonathan. This was very uh, detailed and knowledgeable. I also tried to answer as many questions as I could in the meantime. Um, and I will share my screen now. Um, happy to be here. I'm Victoria Tsukala from the um, European Commission. Um, and I will talk to you about uh, a service that we have for uh, researchers. Uh, free or charge for our grantees to publish their research and get it peer reviewed. And let me hide this. Hide. Sorry. Uh, hide. Yes. So uh, hopefully you can see all, uh, my screen now. Uh, so I work in DG uh, Research and Innovation in the unit that works uh, on uh, open science and um, uh, uh, has this uh, policy. So, oops, sorry. Uh, what is Open Research Europe? Open Research Europe is a publishing platform. It is not a repository. So it is, let's say, a mega journal. Uh, if this is in um, easier terms for you, it's you submit an article and it is peer reviewed there. Um, it is for Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe grantees. And actually as of now, I should edit this slide. It's about uh, all grantees as of now, all grantees of uh, uh, European Commission framework programs are uh, eligible uh, publications. So as you know, there uh, beyond Horizon Europe, there are um, other framework programs. Uh, for any, it's about 30 of them. You can see them uh, in the funding and tenders portal. So uh, all um, articles, uh, research, um, and, you know, that have to do with research um, um, are eligible to be published now in ORE. Uh, it is an optional service, of course. It has no cost to you to publish in open uh, access, of course. And you meet uh, automatically, you comply with your Horizon Europe open access requirements, as Jonathan said earlier. The requirement in Horizon Europe is that wherever you publish, we need open access through um, a trusted repository immediately at the same time as publication. And Aura will do that because it will send your publications to um, a, a trusted repository, Zenodo in specific, um, which is operated by CERN. It is a very innovative publishing model also that's initiated by us. And you may know that other funders support uh, 
platforms for their uh, grantees, such as the Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, their Irish uh, Health Board, uh, among others. Um, and that's innovative in itself, but also the publishing model, which is open peer review after publication, as we call it, a post-publication peer review model. So first you publish, you submit your article, and then the review takes place. And I will show you in detail the process. Uh, all articles and reviews are open access under CC BY license. The platform has very high scientific publishing standards and policies. They're steered and supervised by scientific advisory board. Um, and uh, of course, they're quite actually, they're rigorous, uh, including uh, asking for underlying data availability and open access to research data, if that is possible, the methods used, et cetera. I will show you the details on that as well. So it's quite a rigorous platform. It offers also a transparent services in terms of the editorial process, but also supports research that is transparent and reproducible, actually. Um, and that also I will show you with the process it implements. Uh, everyone's welcome to publish in all disciplines. So um, actually, it's not close. Today, we have 500 articles on the platform. More than 300 of them are peer reviewed and 900 open peer reviews on it. Um, and as content grows, we are gradually developing basically community gateways and collections like um, in specific fields, right? Uh, uh, so we are uh, gradually helping research communities uh, find their way and their home uh, in Ore. Uh, so if you are interested, if you have projects that produce a lot of publications, um, if you're looking for a new, let's say, you, you could call it journal. I mean, you, you need to comply with the policies of the platform, but you make your research available together uh, in, in a place, uh, in a collection, let's say, for example, that is uh, field specific, uh, we invite you to, to contact us. Uh, the platform is indexed in many important indexers. Uh, it does not have a journal impact factor and we do not want it to have one uh, because we do support the um, more specific article level metrics that actually are um, telling about the, the impact significance and the reach a scientific and social uh, of an article, uh, as opposed to assessing excellence by, by the proxy of, of, uh, of journal impact factor. Um, this is a very transparent also process. It's operated by F1000 Research um, for us, uh, who is a publisher and technology provider uh, subsequent to public procurements. Uh, for us, it's in line with our policy. It supports us in uh, operationalizing open science practices such as open access publishing, early sharing of research via preprints, and aligns with our priorities. So it's very yeah, much shows you know that we can walk the talk. It also supports not profit open access publishing and transparent publishing and uh, cost efficiency, actually, it's much cheaper than uh, paying um, exorbitant uh, article processing charges. That's quite clear. It is a long-term commitment by us. And actually, we're currently in discussions with the numerous national funders on how to turn Open Research Europe as of 2026 in a platform that is eligible for all to publish. Of course, all who meet the publishing and, and scientific requirements of the platform without charges to them because uh, a number of uh, a large number of funders will uh, support it. So this is quite an interesting development. We're looking forward to uh, to getting there. Um, so uh, Aura is, is here to stay is basically what I want to say. Um, we think it's a, it's very the benefits are are clear for researchers. I mean they do immediate open access and they comply, of course, with the open access requirements. They get article level metrics, different types of, um, there's open data that supports the reproducibility and reuse of the data and, of course, the reproducibility and verifiability of the conclusions of your publications. Uh, the peer review is rigorous and it's open and it's transparent. Um, and, of course, all of these policies and practices are supported by our International Advisory Board. Of course, it's also optional for you and there's no fee for you and there's no administrative burden for you. You don't need to think again on whether you comply with the open access requirement. Here's the model in uh, more detail. So you have an article to submit, you submit it. And after it goes actually through quite a thorough 
uh, pre-publication check uh, point, then it's published. So the pre-publication has to do with the language, the eligibility, the authorship, plagiarism, but also very specific things that to do with the uh, you know, methodology of the paper, whether your data is available, um, if if possible. Again, we say we understand that it's not always possible, but in principle, it should be. Um, whether it adheres, of course, to the policies and guidelines of the platform, etc. So it's quite uh, extensive. It's not a simple preprint. We call it a publication precisely because it's been through all these very extensive checks. Uh, so then it receives a DOI. It has a, an, a, the uh, layout, uh, you know, it's laid out. It's not just a simple Word file, of course, it's a, and it's in different format, HTML, PDF, etc. And then uh, there's an invitation uh, to five potential reviewers who are uh, checked by, by F1000, and I will uh, show you uh, a bit about that as well, who are invited to uh, review. The author suggests them, but of course, uh, uh, F1000 checks their appropriateness and also suggests as well. So it's a collaborative essentially. It's led by the author, but it is a collaborative uh, sort of process. So once, two ticks or twice approved or once approved with reservation and, and at least uh, once approved, sorry, twice approved with a reservation and once approved, then it's considered to have passed peer review. Uh, of course, a new version may need to be uploaded if uh, significant changes are requested, as you already know. Um, and this, uh, of course, versioning is very clear to see in the platform. And then it's sent to all these different uh, uh, indexers and to Zenodo. Uh, for uh, for the repository requirement. Um, again, we think that also this open peer review, aside from the open publication, is a win-win situation, and you can have these slides to study later on. Uh, I mean, it's a very transparent, it enhances open and transparent scholarly dialogue, and, um, you know, the input we have is that researchers like uh, very much uh, appreciate this uh, transparent process and open peer review, and they also get credit for the review, which can, of course, be cited because it has a DOI. Uh, and again, um, very strong reproducibility, um, uh, you know, features in, in ORE, uh, or open data, making your data open in principle is actually quite a, a strong uh, a measure towards the reproducibility and transparency of research. Um, another point to make here is that uh, aside from research articles, there's a whole slew of other types of articles that the platform supports that actually um, support you or enable you to publish throughout the research process, which is quite important. In fact, about 50% of the articles are of those other types on the platform. So, to get familiar with the platform, you don't necessarily need to send your best research article. We understand that if you're evaluated on the basis of a journal impact factor, which is um, actually, we think, not the appropriate way to be evaluated, nonetheless, uh, mostly people are these days still. Um, we're trying to change this. You may try sending other types of article to start and get familiarized with the, uh, um, with the platform and how it works, such as a uh, a method article or a brief report or a software tour article. These software tour articles actually are quite um, quite um, <clears throat> popular. Um, and it, this way it also helps uh, the open access, of course, to these other types of uh, uh, research outputs uh, by, by making them open access uh, along uh, a, a, such a type of article uh, that's submitted to the platform. Uh, this is how a publication looks like. Uh, you see that you cannot miss the status. This is a revised publication. You can see the approval status of the peer review, and then uh, you can check uh, the peer review um, of both versions, actually, here. So the person revised the, uh, the, the article, and, and then it was reviewed again, and you see that the reviewer uh, approved the second version. Um, you can see that the researchers can put in their ORCID ID, and sorry that you can see that um, this article is included in three different uh, gateways, um, as well as, of course, various types of metrics on the article. On the peer review process, just to say that the reviewers are suggested by article authors, but they are, of course, need to be vetted by the editorial team, that they meet the criteria, that they're experts, that they don't have a conflict of interest. 
um, or they may the editorial team may suggest additional or other uh, potential reviewers. Uh, they are asked qualitative and quantitative, actually checklist questions to answer, checklist as well as qualitative uh, reviews uh, for a guided process that they must follow. Um, then that's different for different domains. And there's also a reviewer code, uh, code of conduct that needs to be followed. Uh, all of this, of course, is checked by the editorial teams. And once the, everything is OK, then it's published. Uh, you can see here an example of a peer review report. You can see that the name of the reviewer um, is visible and their uh, review is visible. Um, it is also can, can be cited. It has a DOI and can be cited. Um, and so, and you can see also their, uh, their final outcome. It's approved with reservations, so they have a question mark. Uh, you see here that the author has responded extensively to, uh, to the review. Um, and pr probably there was a second uh, version that was uploaded uh, addressing what the um, author, the reviewer asked for. Ah, sorry, <laughs> apologies for the uh, slide again. Um, and here you can see all, all sorts of different uh, metrics that uh, appear here um, with altmetric indicators here, um, how many times uh, the article is mentioned in the news, in blogs, in Twitter, um, et cetera, assessing uh, social um, impact uh, of the article. Um, helping research communities find a home in Aura, so there are various levels of collections. The one that's probably researchers are most interested in are the collections. These are very um, uh, domain specific, research specific collections. Uh, there's uh, always uh, an advisor, let's say an editor, a curator of these collections, and you can subscribe basically to this collection so that you get uh, information when there is a new article that's published there. So these are for specialized communities, um, as I mentioned earlier, and if you need a home for, for publications in or of your community, you're very welcome to contact the editors. And then there is higher level um, uh, gateways, as we call them here, for civil engineering or for arts. And there's some by framework program or specifically, uh, for example, for Maurice Skudlovska Curie actions or ERC um, actions, etc., which are okay. They're interesting, but not so much for for uh, researchers really. Uh, follow us uh, online. There is a very uh, uh, vibrant uh, Twitter. Uh, <laughs> following uh, of Open Research Europe. There are also a number of, uh, I should have said, and I should have included here, uh, videos in the uh, um, DG uh, RTD um, uh, YouTube uh, channel on Aura. There is more than 10 videos, which were, are quite uh, uh, short and they're quite uh, uh, interesting, address various things, how you can submit, research data, open data, etc., as well as a newsletter. And you can scan this um, a QR code if you would like to subscribe to news from uh, Aura. And I think this was the last slide. I exceeded a little bit of my time and I apologize okay. for that. <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, so the last part that uh, we'll cover uh, today before the, the Q&A is um, the grant proposal. So the open science part in Horizon Europe grant proposals. Um, so there's two different, um, uh, two different elements. One is on the application form where you have to list uh, five publications, uh, data sets, softwares, or goods or services. And in part B of the project proposals where you have uh, under the excellence methodology and the, the impact and under the quality and efficiency of the implementation, you have to mention open science practices. So in terms of publication, it's one thing that is really important to, um, to know is that all that the publication you, you cite needs to be openly available in open access. Um, so the, your publication will only be uh, evaluated positively or only evaluated if they are uh, openly available. 
um, your publications, the impact factor will not is irrelevant. It will not be considered in the the grant proposal. You need to. Um, it will only be uh, evaluated uh, qual qualitatively. Uh, and in the current proposal, you can also give some insights to uh, where you're hoping to publish, including if you're uh, looking at publishing in full open access journal or on Open Research Europe, which, as Victoria said, is not mandatory, but um, is uh, is an, uh, always an, an option you can uh, go for. In terms of data, your data that you list needs to be on a trusted repository and needs to have a person to persistent identifier, identifier sorry, like a DOI. Um, and they should be uh, fair. So all the data that you, you data set that you mentioned in the grant proposal basically needs to follow the same rules that um, I mentioned before in the requirements at the end uh, during the project and, and after the project. So an official data management plan is not required in the grant proposal, but they do ask you uh, to provide some answers to very similar things to DMP. So it's kind of what I call a, a mini DMP, where you have to, to tell what kind of data you're going to produce, uh, where you're going to, hoping to, um, to, uh, to uh, make it available and all this kind of, uh, which licenses you want to apply. So it is kind of uh, a small DMP without being it's officially one. Uh, you need to have a distinct, uh, distinct web package on, in the project management that must include the DMP as a deliverable. Um, there are other aspects that are eligible in the budget, and I would highly recommend really looking into it because if you are... It, Weirdly enough, if you are asking for more money, but there are things that are related to open science, the people who will be evaluating your 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 grant proposal will um, have an idea that you are really looking into making your your uh, project as openly um, um, and as um, see, uh, as as openly pos uh, as possible. So uh, anything that is relating to um, engagement of citizens, like citizen science and participation in crowdsourcing activities, any data curation costs. So you can hire someone, a data curator, for your for your for your project. Um, if you know that in advance you have you're going to have a lot of data that's in your maybe not specialized in this kind of. Um, uh, data creation activities, then definitely consider hiring someone and adding this kind of cost within the grant proposal. As I mentioned during the, uh, the the first parts of the talk, any article processing charges can be included, but only for full open access journal, not hybrid journals. You, you can obviously publish in the hybrid journals, but you cannot claim the, the, uh, the APCs for those. So, if I need to give you one tip is be as specific as possible. Like in the DMP, you want to be proving to the people reviewing your proposal that you know what you're doing, that you are going to publish uh, your, your work as openly as possible, that you're going to make um, your work, uh, all your data sets, softwares, and other types of research efforts, you're going to be as open, as transparent as possible. And this idea of uh, don't let the, the project officer dig for the information, don't let the, the, the grant proposal um, 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 reviewers search for the information because they want and, um, and that could lower your, your, your score, basically. One thing I notice a lot also is that people in the proposal or even in the DMP will start explaining what open access is, what fair data is. You don't need to, to do that. The people that are reviewing or the project officer, they already know that. So focus quickly on what you will be doing during the, the project. So the ERC and the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship is um, slightly different. I won't go into too much details, uh, but they are um, very similar basically to what the Horizon Europe is um, is doing. Uh, there's no in the ERC. There's no explicit evaluation or to of open science practices, but including them will um, 
will only have a positive impact. You won't be scored negatively for it, but if you do include them, you will be scored better. Um, there is no specific work package in the ERC, um, but you do have to um, uh, to issue a, a DMP. For the Marie Curie, uh, you do need to have um, in, in the uh, excellence criteria, there is um, this element of open science that is, um, is present. And also you need to have specific training activities and career development plan that are present in the proposal to show that uh, the person getting the, the, um, the grant will undergo training in specific aspect of open science and uh, innovation. Um, there is a set, so obviously what we talked about is mostly publication and data set, but there is also open science is an umbrella term. There's a lot of other different aspects that into, into account, and they are uh, what we called uh, open science recommended practices that will not lower your score if you don't have them, but if you do, they will uh, be positive. Um, so um, as I said, there won't be any impact on the score. Um, but the mandatory open science practices will lower your score if you don't um, if you don't include them. Uh, so here is just for reference the different types of uh, mandatory and recommended practices. And I'm just going to go over a couple of those recommended practices to give you an, an idea of what they, they could be. So in some fields, it can be interesting to do what we call the pre-registration. Um, where basically you're going to um, publish in advance the plan for the for specific uh, research uh, study, um, including anything that is related to the um, uh, research question, the, the hypothesis that, you're, um, that you will be doing. Um, and this allows you to have basically uh, exclusivity on this because you will have um, um, a person identify issued to you so people can already start um, um, mentioning this uh, specific uh, plan. Preprints is a bit the same thing, the same concept, but uh, uh, making your work available before peer reviewing on the preprint repository. And as you can see, there's a lot of different preprint repositories now available. The first one was archive, and now there's a lot of uh, different ones for different uh, field of research. And again, that gives you exclusivity on uh, research because you can start um, already um, be uh, cited on this uh, on those aspects on, on that paper, even before it has undergone um, peer review. Public engagement through, for instance, citizen science is something that is becoming more and more important for the European Commission. Um, and so I would suggest if you can to think about how you could include uh, the, the public in your in your grant proposal, in, in your research in, ge in general and, um, and in your proposal. So citizen science. Um, and just to finish, before we uh, go to the Q&A, and I already saw there's quite a, a few uh, uh, dozen questions, um, when you're, whether you're at the design phase or, where, where, or if you already have uh, a Horizon Europe grant, or if you haven't done so already, design an open science strategy for your project. So lay down everything that you need to do in terms of requirements, lay down everything that you could do in terms of maybe recommended open science practices, and really have a plan of how you're going to implement those. This will help you when uh, you need to uh, write your DMP, which you know is by uh, month six. So don't wait month five to start writing it because it does take a lot of time. Um, so start from the beginning of the project. And if you, um, in the grant proposal, you will have already kind of done a mini DMP. So that will help you in, in the process. Um, be as specific as possible, really explain everything that's the, the reasoning behind why you're going for a specific repository, why you're going for 
a specific tool that might be proprietary but is used um, widely in your in your field, justify every decision that you that you make. Um, and yes, keep track of the issues. There's no right or wrong answer. There's things always go wrongly at one point in a, in a project, but that's okay. Just keep track of the issues and discuss the the solutions. Um, so yes, that's uh, the just because this is recorded just for reference. The next webinar, so we organize this webinar three times a year, um, and the next one will be on the 19th of March at 3 p.m. CET. And on this, thank you very much. And we now have uh, half an hour for, or 35 minutes for some uh, questions. And let's have a look. Do you want me to, I could uh, summarize a few things that I saw that I thought were sure. important yeah. that were asked. So a couple of times, one about the um, impact journal, impact factor of ORE. Um, um, yeah, starting with ORE, just to clean that. Yes, the journal does not, the ORE does not have a journal impact factor. And I guess I mentioned that we do understand that uh, a lot of you may need this for your, um, uh, for your, uh, you know, advancement. So uh, as I said, again, maybe you can consider to try or to sending other types of uh, articles first before trying to, uh, a research paper. Although if you're not up for tenure and you're already a tenure professor, then I don't see why uh, that should prevent you. Then uh, then we want you to to come up front and try or and try this new way of of publishing with open uh, post publication peer review. Um, um, yeah, I think this probably is the most important question on on ORE. Uh, also, funding EU funding is required. At least one author part of the work needs to be funded. Um, uh, by Horizon Europe or any other uh, framework program. Um, I think that's about it. There were a few questions, I think, about uh, licenses and licenses of data, and uh, that was quite interesting. I mean, the minimum licensing requirement of Horizon for articles is CC BY, and all articles must have CC BY. Longer format uh, publications, including actually articles in collected you know, in edited volumes. These are considered journal articles. They're self-sufficient publications that should, uh, in short format, they should be uh, CC BY license. Monographs, on the other hand, there were a little bit more tolerant. We understand that both the industry and the researchers, for different reasons, may want uh, more uh, restrictive licenses. So uh, NC and D licenses um, are, are, are allowed uh, there. Um, and then for data, for research data, um, research data that is open needs to have a CC BY license or a zero license. Um, a zero license is obviously much easier for those disciplines that mix and match various types of data and large amounts of data. It's, it's kind of more difficult to do that if there is a CC BY license. Uh, that is why um, there's the option for CC0 license as well. Um, and the same for, for metadata, it needs to be uh, um, in CC0 license. And then in those very few cases of research data that is closed and nobody should know about, then, um, then I mean, even the metadata can be hidden, but that does not concern most of the horizon uh, cases. So, um, and in terms of your DMP, I think other a lot of other questions, and maybe Jonathan knows better to answer this, on the DMP and fairness and all of that, we understand that researchers, not all researchers are well versed on that. That's why, I mean, there are quite a few resources suggested by the uh, program guide as well, and Open Air has uh, lots more uh, to offer. Uh, but already the, the template of the uh, proposal shows you what the requirements are for FAIR that should be already answered at proposal stage, but there are critical elements in the in a DMP. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't know, Jonathan, if you want to add. And there were num numerous other questions on when you make them open. I mean, we have FAIR and open. Openness is not part of fairness. It, data needs to be FAIR and ideally needs to be open unless there are these exceptions that Jonathan uh, talked about. Um, and so you can make all of your data open or some of it open or so there is flexibility 
on that and all of this needs to be explained uh, in your DMP and the project officer will assess this along with uh, reviewers that will review your projects. Jonathan, I will uh, let you uh, speak now. I think I tried to summarize a little bit uh, some of the things that I saw recurring there. Yeah, I, I think the the thing to remember is this is a, a one hour, one hour and a half webinar. So obviously we can't go into details of what the fair principles are of how to write a proper DMP. The 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 um, the, the uh, recommendations that we give of uh, being detailed and all that, obviously you need to look a bit more into what really goes into your DMP. So you need to look at the different resources to um, really know how to write properly a, a DMP. And if it's the first time you hear about the FAIR principles, I would highly recommend you do one of those sh short courses or if, um, or guides to, to get a bit more familiar with what the FAIR principles are. Um, because at first, I, I know it can be a bit confusing. It's it's a lot of things that, uh, that is being asked of you because that's not, you know, your specialty is not to write DMPs and, and know about the FAIR principles. Um, but it does make sense once it's applied to to your 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 project. So obviously this is just an overview of what you need to do, but you do need to um, dig a bit more into into all that. Um, in terms of there was a question about uh, using amnesia for anonymization and also another question about anonymization. Uh, they were saying Zenodo treats pseudonymized data as personal data, which should not be uploaded to this repository. Does it mean the researcher should opt for restricted access, but deposit data in, for instance, institutional archive to store data long term? So the the short answer is that you should only um, uh, share the the data that you are um, allowed to share. So even if it's in closed access, you would still need to put the metadata. Even if you don't put basically any data linked to to on Zenodo, you should still deposit the metadata so people know that the data exists. If you manage to anonymize, and I know there's um, this concept that data can never truly be anonymized, and I think that's a whole uh, field of research in in itself. Um, tools like um, Amnesia do help you to anonymize the data, but there might be some cases when you have very little um, data points or if your your um, the, the people that have very specific type of uh, criteria that by just looking at at the data, you you could be able to, oh, it's in this specific country that is really small and it's this specific person that has is the only person to have this uh, that uh, disease then obviously that would not be anonymized because you could be able to um to to tell apart the the the, the people uh, the person that is uh, is um the data is referring to but in most cases i would argue that amnesia is able to anonymize the data and it, you can have a look uh, more at um at the tool itself to have a look but this is something that you might want to discuss with uh, the, um, um, the GDPR person, which is the, uh, I forgot the name, uh, the... Um... Data protection. Uh... Thank you. Yeah. Yes, data, the DPO, the data protection DPO, officer, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also the chief information security officer that you should have usually in, uh, in research in institutes. Um, they will be also able to help you in deciding what you should be doing or not should not be doing in terms of of your data. So do seek out the specialists that are in your in institutions, and if they're not, then seek out other specialists or other researchers that deal with the same type of the data that you uh, uh, that you do and would see what they have uh, they have done. Um, could you indicate what CC0 has a preference about CC BY for data? So the main reason why we prefer CC0 in data is what's called uh, the issue of um, attribution stacking. So where you're going to have data set A that refers 
uh, that is referred by data set B, but it's a merge of data set uh, A and C. And so you need to cite data set A, all the people from data set A, and also all the people from data set B. But then data set D is referring data set C. So you would need to refer to attribute all the people from the first three data sets. And it, you can see where this is going at the end if you're having um, a project that is based on uh, other data sets, that is based on other data sets, then there's a lot of, um, of attribution to, to be doing. So it's to make sure that uh, it's openly, um, it's as reusable by others as possible without having to make this huge list of, uh, of offers. But obviously the best practice is always to, to, to cite, is just um, legal aspect, let's say, to be able to reuse the data without having this, um, uh, issue of attribution stacking. Um, then there was a question for making metadata reproducible would also including RStudio scripts, for example, or just the metadata and readme files. Yes, definitely the RStudio scripts uh, is definitely one of those other research outputs that you can mention because it's it falls under the category of there's other um, research outputs that are used to uh, justify the data. So if I wanted to check that your, you did run your analysis correctly, then if I already have the, the, the R script, I can run it myself and see, okay, they did everything uh, correctly. So this falls also under the category of um, this type of readme files and it's just making the the reviewing process easier for, for everyone. So yes, definitely include those. Um, does the distinction between results and other results still apply if the primary product is working on its software? Would it not need to move to results then? I honestly don't know. I, I don't know if, uh, Victoria has an idea on this, but I would ask the project officer directly actually for this kind of a bit more specific. Uh, I, I would argue that no, because they're a bit different from the definition, they would still fall under other results, but they could still be considered as a data set in, in a certain way, if depending on what kind of software you're, you're building. Uh, but I would ask directly the the project officer. I think that's the the best option for for this type of um, uh, project specific uh, issues. I don't yeah. know yeah. how to report them. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. agree. <laughs> um, is publishing at Aura available only for EC grant holders and partners teams, or also for researchers without EC funding? Part of the project needs part of the paper at least, or let's say, yeah, part of the paper needs to have been funded. So the, the results of what you are writing in the paper at least needs to, the research or part of the research behind the paper needs to be, uh, have been funded by um, by the commission. So by one of the framework programs. This mean may mean in practice, since you have a lot of researchers often collaborating that one of the uh, authors uh, has an EC grant, which is relevant on the topic and part of the resulting work, which is published, has been funded by it. So not everyone, but partly at least to have been funded, yes. This also includes, I have to say, maybe just to clarify, cascade funding, for example, cost actions or like other funding that, you know, that we may give to member states and then they also add funding and, and, um, and, uh, um, yeah, so join undertakings and all of these things are, are included, so. Okay, so next, um, I'm also looking at the, I'm just going to repeat some of the um, question and answers that you, you answer, Victoria, just for yes, if people didn't read them. So should the DMP be published in repository as well? Um, you can answer if you want, or I can just yes, read I mean, your answer. I mean, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, it can, if you would like, that would be good. It's not a requirement that, uh, I mean, if it's an open deliverable and 
we recommend, I think, that they're open, but th there might be reasons if the data is closed that it also is closed. So in that case, no, but if you want to put it in the repository, all the better, right? So, uh, um, yeah. And and Argos, for instance, this tool to write for the MPs allows you to decide whether you want it to be open or closed, and it will publish it uh, to, to Zenodo also. So that's another added uh, value of using um, uh, tools uh, such as uh, Argos. Um, the deadline to publish the data in the repository, how pre precisely should they be defined? Um, do you want me to read the answer or should I? Sure, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you should, so Victoria was saying you should define this in your DMP, it should be reasonable. It is not as demanding immediately as the publication of an article. But unless there's a good reason, you should not keep your data locked up and closed. Data should generally be in a repository when they underpin an article at article publication. Um, are there any experiences with feedback on the DMP on my part, even explicitly asking for feedback when submitting the DMP? I did not hear anything back. I think it really depends on the on the project officer. Uh, that's very... Uh, yeah. I've heard people to... <laughs> The project officer really being on the back of the researchers for for this kind of things and others that just didn't hear back so that really depends that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do a good job for your dmp because it's not just for the funder that you know to prove that you're doing things right but it's also for you to make sure that you didn't miss something about um, data availability or you know oh where do i store this personal data is my the security of my uh, um of my institution enough, or should I uh, contract a, a different uh, tool? So all this is still useful for, for you. Um, how hard are the OS criteria in the overall assessment of a grant proposal? Can one be excluded even if the scientific competence part is very good? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. Excluded, no, but of course, I mean, uh, you will be assessed. So you'll be assessed on how you uh, say that you will implement the mandatory open science requirements. And if you fall short, grading will be less. So in that sense, I mean, you're... Your, I mean, you need to pass the pass mark, which is ten, I think. But, but the thing is, how how many other uh, proposals are there? If if they do better on open science, it's always who else is applying and how good they're doing. So, uh, they are assessed. If you're asking whether they're disregarded, they're not. Um, and they can also, as Jonathan explained earlier, earn you extra points if you decide to apply some of the recommended practices and weave them very well into your proposal. Uh, and methodology, then that could reversely earn you grades. But um, it's very clear that grades are cut if you're not addressing sufficiently the mandatory open science requirements. And this may bring you in a disadvantaged position vis-a-vis -vis other proposals that may end up getting the money then, even because of that, of course. So a question about licensing can basically, what are long tanks formats and can um, ch chapters in an edited book, um, they are not um, eligible because they are considered as articles. Um, so, and someone was mentioning, how can the, the license of the book be different from the chapters? It can be. It's uh, So you, you might see on some website, for instance, that they will say, um, the website is uh, under CC by license, except for exceptions like images, for instance, it will have a clear license. It's the kind of the same concept. You can have uh, um, copyrighted a book, for instance, and have some chapters that are under CC by license because the authors decided to to have uh, have it like uh, like this. Um, so it's not incompatible to have different licenses within a, a, a same book. Um, but chapters in an edited book are not considered as long text formats. Basically, if you're not in the humanities, it's rare when you 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 would have a long text format. It's more in the humanities where a, a single author or a couple of authors are writing an entire book about uh, a subject. Um, 
one thing we learned in FP7 and H2020 is that in line with fair can mean anything and nothing. What is the Horizon Europe minimal expectation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the minimal expectation is required in the proposal, actually. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, you need to explain how they will be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And their specific, uh, uh, I mean, tells you what you need to answer to, basically. So it's not very vague. I mean, the legal text in the grant agreement that is what defines the policy is, of course, general, but um, that should be your measure. I mean, it's uh, quite a clear instruction there what uh, should be answered. Um, it's Figshare Trusted Repository. Where can I generally check this? So as I mentioned during the talk, uh, open door for publications and uh, research data. But yes, Figshare is considered a trusted repository. You will find it on research data. So that is a, a repository you can go for. Who checks the validity of justifications for not disclosing research data? That would be the project officer. Um, can the DMPB be a subject for revision and impact money release? Yes, definitely. It's as I was saying, the DMP is a living document. So even if it's not the project officer that comes back to you and say, you shouldn't make this and this modification, you yourself, as, as soon as there are some modifications, they, someone, a, a new partner, I don't know, I'm inventing, but a new partner or new person working on the project, then you should definitely update already the uh, the DMP. And yes, not complying with the European Commission's mandates is um, can have a, an, an impact. Um, I don't know if it's in practice, actually, there's, there's examples of projects that have undergone uh, um, restrictions, uh, budget restrictions. I don't know if that does exist. In practice, we try to avoid this. There have been, but for other reasons, yeah. too. So um, these are, yeah, um, um, yeah, we, I mean, we check not only open access, but there are various other requirements, right, uh, to check. Uh, and some have, but uh, yes, this is our last resort. I mean, usually there is a, you know, there is a recommendation or a, a requirement or advisement by by the PO that uh, you know what you should do to to fix the situation, you know, before you get there. So, I'm trying to find other questions. I haven't answered. I think that's more or less it. Ah, yes. Should the raw data also be published in the research data repository or analyzed data along publication will be enough? What does raw data mean for the European Commission? Um, so this is more around the, it's, um, this again, it's not a right or wrong answer because you should publish all the different, um, steps in your, from the raw data to the, um, uh, to the final data that you use for as an integral part of your, your, um, a publication. So even if you don't use some data in a publication, you should still, um, publish it, make it, uh, openly available if possible. So if you know that the raw data could be useful to other researchers, then you should definitely uh, um, do that. There are some cases I know that the raw data is completely useless, then that's, you know, you as a researcher that decides this is not um, exploitable for others. And also it doesn't, is not needed for, um, for the, uh, it's better to have it on, the edited um, analyzed data. Um, but I would argue that most of the time you can share the, the raw data. You might not realize that it can be useful for others. And so I would say that I've talked with some researchers and they explained what their raw data was. And I said, okay, yes, that is a case of raw data not being uh, useful. But in most cases, it it is uh, it is exploitable by by others, even if you don't realize um, 
because what could be noise, I have this expression when I, I, I talk about uh, research data management is what is noise for you can be data for others. So it can definitely be exploited by others, whereas for you, it's just useless raw data. So, um, so yeah. Um, I have a question of when will Ori and OpenAir join Mastodon? <laughs> uh, I think Ori is already as a, like the Twitter version of no. It's in Twitter, so Mastodon. Yeah, but but there's like this. I know OpenAir is on Mastodon as a like um, a duplicate of what is published on on. Uh, uh. I don't know, but yeah. I am a digital immigrant in the social media, so I will be entirely unhelpful in this. I should find out. <laughs> no. Um... Um... If anyone wants to, I know we said to put in the Q and A, but if anyone had the answer, uh, the question not answered, just paste it in the chat, and we will um, just copy paste in the chat. But I don't see any other um, questions that we didn't cover. Okay, so we have I have. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I said the RRS. I think maybe uh, I sh I give a short uh, answer to that RRS is the rights retention strategy. So um, this has been supported very much by the Coalition S group of funders. Uh, the Commission supports uh, Coalition S and uh, and uh, Plan S. Uh, for us, I mean, uh, rights retention is something very. Specific, we ask uh, in the grant agreement that the uh, author or their be the beneficiary, their institution, maintain enough rights to provide um, the open access as required, meaning with CC BY license and all the other things that Jonathan explained uh, as a requirement. So you need to maintain enough rights to do so. Um, and we explain in the annotated grant agreement that. Uh, Basically, effectively, by signing the grant agreement, you have a prior obligation, a prior legal obligation to your funder, the European Commission, to do what you have agreed to do, which is to maintain enough rights in order to provide the open access as you have agreed to do in a repository with CC BY, etc. So um, you may inform, we, we recommend that you inform your, your publisher ahead of time that you, know, you are either required to, to have enough rights uh, this does not actually mean ma ma maintain enough rights to provide the open access means basically that uh, yeah that in the end that uh, you need you need to retain some of your rights. So uh, uh, a lot of publishers are trying to block this. They're either I mean may charge more money for you to provide open access to your author um, um, manuscript or. Um, they can even outright reject papers. They've uh, they've also done that. So uh, uh, we look uh, we're looking at a at a wave of uh, resistance here, um, but uh, this cannot uh, you know this this cannot continue further. I mean, uh, funders are becoming stricter and stricter about this. I mean, you need to provide the open access. So you need to be uh, able to do so. And in fact, I mean, the commission is looking into other measures, either um, guide, guidelines or even regulatory, even law measures in the future that will enable uh, a, a copyright framework and the ability of researchers and institutions to manage more properly their rights in such a way that they're fit for a digital era and that, that they enable open science and open access. Because now, uh, what researchers do is that they transfer their rights and here immediately is where the publishers block the uh, the open access. So um, 
in general, the, the reaction of the publishers is uh, to try and block it. So that's uh, as far as we know. In the UK also, we have to say that uh, there are some institutions that have very strict also uh, rights retention policy. And then also um, it has to do with the law of the different countries. So for example, um, if I'm not mistaken, some UK institutions, their right retention is that they say, basically, they inform the publishers that already the author accepted manuscript is licensed already by the author under a CC, uh, CC by license. Uh, in the UK, it's possible to do that. In Greece, for example, you cannot do that. In Italy, I, I, I don't think you can do that either. So, uh, But you can inform, in that case, your publisher that you, know, you are required to maintain rights and you're required to provide this open access. Uh, in both cases, either way, publishers are not very happy, neither with the UK case nor um, nor with uh, with other cases where you inform them of this prior license. So uh, you may expect there are some. And in this case, we recommend that you find another publisher that you publish in Ore or uh, yes. So if uh, um, if you cannot do that, so uh, we we outright uh, recommend in the AGA, in the annotated grant agreement that you find another publisher, so. And and I think the, the, the one thing that you may want to ask yourself is why am I wanting to publish with this, uh, this big publisher? Because the big publisher tends to be the ones with the high impact factor, but as it's been mentioned, the European Commission doesn't care about the impact factor, only the quality of the, the publication. So why, why is the real reason why you're publishing in thinking of publishing with the, those um, publishers and is it really necessary to publish with those if you exclude the the, um, the impact factor in, in it and then you might realize that you could go for a um, full open access journal or even for the aura because in the end what matters is that your work is there and citable and not mislead on the journal has that has a high impact factor. I don't know if that was what you were referring to by big publishers, but in my experience, big publishers are the one with the higher impact factor and that the ones that are the most yeah. unwilling to uh, to accept the rights retention strategy. Um, so on this, I think we will uh, close two minutes uh, before the the end um thank you very much victoria for for being here thank you very much for everyone for your questions for your uh, interest in this and um yes if you have any other future questions don't hesitate to to uh, contact us we're always happy to to help um and as i said there was a, a typo on my slide the next webinar is in march 2024 not 2023 um so 19th of march 2024 uh thank you again everyone and uh, and have a nice uh, end of the day then thank you thanks thank you. for joining everyone goodbye bye bye